Welcome to My Morning Cup, a podcast produced by Costa Media Advisors, a strategic communications company. My Morning Cup, where we have interesting conversations with genuine people. I'm Mike Costa, your host. This week, we're doing things a little different on My Morning Cup. Today, producer Madison McCann and I look back at our first year of the podcast. Madison's role recording, editing, and offering input on how to improve My Morning Cup has contributed directly to its success. Madison, welcome to My Morning Cup and the other side of the microphone. Before we jump into our retrospective, let me ask, what's in your morning cup? Well, every morning I start with regular coffee. And I put two tablespoons of almond milk and a tablespoon of sugar-free caramel syrup in it. And how is that weird? Well, it's just very particular. Like, I measure everything out. Are you that particular? You're taking, like, a tablespoon and you're measuring? (laughs) Really? Do you do that with everything? Yeah. Do you like baking? I do, yeah. I don't do it as often as I used to, but yeah, I love it. Do you like it better than cooking? Yeah, um, because you do have to do measurements like that. So Yeah, Yeah. and and that's why I ask, because I like to cook, and my wife likes to bake. And the worst thing you could do for me is to tell me a measurement. Oh, you just throw it all in. I I mean, I'll I'll use measurements, but I use my eye a lot. In, In cooking, you're cooking the taste. But if you try that with baking... Because I tried it. I, I remember once Susie and the girls were out, and I decided I had a sweet tooth. And I decided, I'm going to make some chocolate chip cookies. Well, these things turned out. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> I mean, they just spread on the sheet, yeah. and it, it was horrible. So uh, when it comes to bacon, yeah. if I can't just get the box and put an egg in and some water in and mix it up, I, I, I'm, I'm no good. <laughs> no, it, you have to trust it, the recipe. Trust the recipe. It, the way that you do your coffee is similar to my wife with her morning concoction. She's always taking and measuring this stuff. And I, I just, I don't, I don't get mm-hmm. it, I guess. Well, I think it says a lot about a person. Because <laughs> I'm like that with a lot of things in life. And I've noticed with some of our guests who are also particular, like I see similarities mm-hmm. with them. So I think that takes us to our first question. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, what is that question? Um, just general reflections on what's been going on this past year with the podcast. Well, I, I, th- I always think the best place to start is the beginning. I want to talk about how we got together oh, and how okay. this podcast started. When I came back from the uh, sabbatical I took in Montgomery, I worked in Montgomery for 18 months running some television stations and realized that Montgomery was not the place for me, but Chattanooga was, and I wanted to get back. And when I came back and started looking at, uh, looked at starting my business, Costa Media Advisors, one of the things I wanted, to, I was always interested in, was a podcast because my first love was radio. I was that kid when he was twelve, thirteen, calling the DJs, not necessarily to make a request, but to talk to them, you know, kind of get a feel for what they do. And so I always had a love of radio, did it in college, and then podcasting came along. And uh, I had a thought on a podcast for a long time, for about a, a year, year and a half. The idea was to talk to successful people about their career paths, because everyone's is different, and there's a lot of great lessons there. But also looking at the generation of my daughter's ages, which you happen to fall in that also, of, I think... The digital revolution and social media has been, for the most part, positive. A lot of great things have it. But the downside of it is you look on whether it's Instagram, Facebook, whatever the app is, and, you know, it's someone standing on top of the world. They got everything. They got the new car. They're on a vacation. And you look and you go, they're my age. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why why am I not there? And and So I, I wanted to illustrate that people who are successful today have had long winding up, down, back and forth career paths that haven't been a straight line to the top. You know, that path up the mountain is never straight. Drive up Lookout Mountain, you know, you're going back and forth. You know, so that was kind of the premise of the podcast. And I didn't know how to start. So I talked to a couple of people, got some great help from Clint Powell, got some great help from Sean Whitfield. And I really got to give those two credit for really getting me started in terms of 
saying, yeah, why wouldn't you want to do a podcast? Because uh, Clint's been doing podcasts for a long time. Uh, Sean's been doing radio shows, and he's even built a podcast studio. But I wanted something closer to home. So I'm, I'm here in the Business Development Center, and I had built a little bit of a relationship with uh, Lynn Chestnut, who runs the Tennessee Small Business Development Center. And I was telling Lynn about my idea, and he says, well, you know, we got a podcast studio. Mm -hmm. I said, well, geez, Lynn, I'd like to see that sometime. <laughs> And so he brings me into the studio that we're in right now. And I said, you know, I really want to get this thing going. But even though I was in broadcasting 35 years, I never learned to edit, mm -hmm. you know, because I came up on the sales end. And I probably should have advanced my skills and learned some of those technical things. But, you know, by nature, I'm a lazy guy and things were going my way. And so I didn't feel the need to do that. But hey, I know that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's what Lynn said. Lynn says, well, you know what, Mike? Madison McCann, who works for us, she does our podcast and is starting a side hustle of being a podcast producer. Yeah. Lynn, connect me with yeah. Madison. And, we did. and there you go. That's how we yeah, started. I, I think it was pretty immediate, too. Like We sat down and had a planning meeting, and then you asked Clint to be the first guest, and we recorded, and then... A couple of weeks later, we started releasing. Yeah, it was. And I do need to give you a lot of credit. It was really your organizational skills, your impetus that really got this going. This idea would still be in my head today. And um, after one year of doing it, it's been very fulfilling. I a lot of people ask me, well, why'd you start the podcast? And I answer them honestly. I did it for my ego. It sounds like a flippant answer. But the ability to talk to a lot of different people and really get the true self, you know, as opposed to what we see every day or what you perceive, because you don't know everyone's struggles. Right. You don't know the challenges they've had. That's been the fulfilling thing. And if people are listening to it and getting something out of it, I'm thrilled with that. Well, I think you do a really good job of drawing people out and getting those answers because it's really easy to just breeze over things and let people... Um, give the highlight reel. Not everyone wants to highlight their failures necessarily, but people have had really organic, genuine conversations on this podcast. I think so too. That's been the thing I've enjoyed the most, the way people have, have just opened up. And, and frankly, that's one thing I like about just an audio podcast. Very consciously decided we were only going to do audio. I didn't want to do a video podcast. And part of that was all the years running television stations that, you know, the number one rule, the worst thing you could do, put on a screen is two talking heads, <laughs> you know, and just watching them talk to each other. You've got to have something else. So that was a, a big driver for me just to do audio. But then I also go back to love of radio. And there's just something about the spoken word and a conversation. And we keep our podcast to 30 to 40 minutes right amount of time for a commute from you know, home to your job or a, a, a quick walk or, or part of your workout. And I, I just think in that amount of time, we have enough to flesh out some of the details and we're, we're not burdened with, hey, we got to take a commercial break now. That was very important to me to just have a format where we can have a free-flowing conversation. So a lot has happened in yes, the past yes, year. Yes. Do you want to talk about some of the most memorable moments? Well, it's hard to pick out a most memorable mm -hmm. moment because each person kind of had their own. I'll tell you a couple that really jumped out at me. Um, when I had Mayor Kelly on, I was, I was struck by how forthright and just direct and honest he was. Mm -hmm. uh, not just because we didn't talk about city issues. We talked about Tim Kelly. And prior to him coming in to do the podcast— there was an article in the Times Free Press it featured Tim Kelly and it featured Mayor Weston Wong, you know, their paths to their different mayorships. And there was a quote from Mayor Kelly in that article that he said, you know, in my family, there was a premium on being right. And, you know, I brought that quote up to him and it led to a conversation of him being very open of what I thought was everyone experienced was not necessarily so. And, and he talked very openly of benefiting from talking to counselors and things like that. And I think that's a really important message for today because 
Tim's a little bit younger than me, and in our generation, you know, it was suck it up, rub some dirt on it. You'll be okay. Get back in the game. And the reality is, is you've got to talk through some things. I, and I mentioned on that particular podcast that it was a huge benefit for me having switched careers, having really lost the identity I had for 30 years of being able to talk to someone about that. And it got me over the hump. Uh, much like uh, when we had Mayor Womp on. Wesson Womp's a young guy, ambitious guy, has a lot going on, is already mayor of his county, uh, has a bright future ahead. But to see him light up and talk about, of all things, architecture <laughs> and kind of disengage mm-hmm. from, from um, a man on the move and a man with a plan to, you know what, when I want to relax, what I like to do is sit down at a drafting board and design a home. Mm-hmm. That was good to see because you realize there's a real person in there who who is more than just what's next. Yeah. A couple that really stuck out to me were because of the place I am in in life. So specifically women business owners yeah, yeah. and uh, like Becky Blazing and Ella Livingston, Tiffany Robinson. There were, I mean, there were a bunch, but each of them had this overarching theme of if not me, then who? Yeah. And why can't I do it? And no, no one's going to do it for me. Isn't that a great message? And I got to tell you, I've enjoyed talking to the entrepreneurs and particularly the female entrepreneurs as much as anything else. Unless you just go out and seek different voices, you'll end up with voices that are similar to yourself. And that was a concern going into this. I got a lot of, great friends. 99.9% of them are old white guys like me. (laughs) And if we just filled our podcast with that, it would limit the audience. And I've learned so much from, you know, people like Felicia, Mm -hmm. people like, my goodness, Becky's story, you know, her different career path, but now fighting cancer Mm -hmm. through it. Just her ability to stick to, Mm -hmm. you know, her plan, you know, I, I've, I've known Leslie Gower for years, and uh, really until we sat down and talked on this podcast, I really didn't know her whole story. Yeah. And I will never forget her story specifically of when she unleashed the beast. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you the story that I remember most from Leslie's podcast as she was going through, you know, her career path. And by nature, she's a shy person. Mm-hmm. And um, she said that you know, she would be in these meetings and, and offer, well, we ought to be doing this, or we thought about this, but was never the person to raise their hand and say, this is what we ought to be doing. And, and at one point in a meeting, a moderator kind of picked up on that and kind of stopped and said, hey, wait a minute, what's your opinion? And really pushed her on, why not you? You need to step forward. And, uh, you know, as you said, unleash the beast from that yeah. point. On. Hey, those were her words. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and we, we've got the tape to prove it. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, you know, Ella's story, Ella's story is so neat. Um, met Ella here in the Business Development Center, Coco Sante Chocolate, got to know her a little bit, had her on the podcast. And, and at the time, she was trying to start this business. But she was also remotely teaching second grade and STEM and doing all these things. And uh, our podcast had nothing to do with this, but it was just coincidental. A few weeks after, she was, lack of a better term, discovered, featured mm-hmm. uh, on Instagram. Uh, Keith, and Lee. The, Keith Keith yeah. Lee. Yeah. And her, her stock sold out the next yeah. day. Yeah. And, you know, I would venture to say the last six months uh, to a year has been a whirlwind for Ella because that established her business not on a local basis, but on a national and international mm-hmm. basis. Yeah. Did you know Keith Lee before that? No, no I, I'm 61. Okay. <laughs> You're not on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I know who he is now, but yeah. at the time I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, another person that I really want to highlight is Dewan. Because whenever she told her story, like I still think about it of how if your words can speak death onto someone, what if you use them to speak life instead? And that is something that 
sticks with me still to this day. Yeah. And, and Dewan's again, everyone's story is extremely interesting, but we're in the podcast and the conversation starting. And I had never heard this before out of her. She starts to tell the story of being a young kid fighting over the front seat with her brother as young kids do and saying to him, I hope you get shot in the head. And he did yeah. not, right that, not right that second, but later that day, there was a stray bullet and they were, and fortunately her brother's okay. And, and, but what a life changing event and to have your whole attitude shifted because of that. And I've gotten to know Dewan through launch and I can't think of um, a lot of people who are more positive and, and trying to put more good into the community than she is. She really embodies that mindset. Yeah. You can tell yep. just from talking to her, it really did change her whole life at 12 years old. Yeah. yeah. As it should, <laughs> that would change well, anyone's life. <laughs> well, you know, it, it should, but also think it's a 12 year old. A lot of 12 year olds would go, oh, okay, I'll move on to the next thing. That, that worked out. Okay. So that didn't have a big, True. but True. To, to have it shift you the way it shifted her is really pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the other thing I wanted to really kind of bring up is I love Mitch Patel's story, and I think everyone loves Mitch mm -hmm. Patel's story because it's the quintessential American success yeah. story. You know, father immigrated here, called for the family. They built businesses. Eight dollars in his pocket. Eight bucks <laughs> in his pocket. And and what I didn't know is Mitch's dad left India when he was a toddler, and Mitch didn't see him until he was about five. And, uh, you know, had to get reacquainted with him. Didn't know who this strange man was. But, uh, you know, Mitch's drive and what he's done and built his company is interesting. But I also find a lot of interest in a couple of other guys I spoke to, in particular Wade Hinton and uh, Kenyatta Ashford, African-American males who, uh, particularly in Wade's case, felt he had to leave Chattanooga to succeed uh, because the opportunities weren't necessarily there uh, for someone like him, but made the decision to come back and has really built a network, uh, not just for himself, but for others, modeling what success is like. I think it brings out that Chattanooga's got a lot of great attributes, and I'm, I'm one of the biggest praisers of Chattanooga. I, I'm very fortunate that I moved here two decades ago, but there's a lot of work to do. There, there's still a lot of barriers to everyone participating fully in the success that Chattanooga's had. And, and I, I think Wade did a good job of expressing that. Um, I love Kenyatta Ashford's story. Uh, you know, Kenyatta is a uh, renowned chef. Not a lot of people in Chattanooga realize this guy won Chopped. That's a pretty popular show. And he won it. And that's a tough thing to do. What I liked about Kenyatta is the name of his restaurant. You know, he, he's working on getting a brick and mortar launched right now, but neutral ground. And, you know, so finding out that, because when I first read that, I'm like, what does that mean? Neutral that? ground? Who names a <laughs> restaurant neutral ground? Man? But when he explained it, having been from New Orleans and neutral ground was the trolley tracks that run through the center of the city that on the tracks, it's neutral ground. And on the one side, it's, it's this territory and that side, it's the other. But when you're on neutral ground, you're in a good mm -hmm. place. Yeah. And you can find anyone there, any lifestyle, any career, you know, everyone yeah. can come together there. Yeah, there, yeah there, there's no names, there's no titles, there's no presumption. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that, though, about Wade coming back to Chattanooga. There were a couple of other people like Rich Mazingo and yeah. Tom Cupo. And I feel like there was this recurring theme that there's some kind of draw to Chattanooga. They wanted to come back. Or if they've always been here, they never wanted to leave. Yeah, I think um, particularly over the last couple of decades, anyone that, that's been here for a amount of time and then left goes to whatever new city they're going to. And you think, okay, it's going to be like Chattanooga. There's a lot of cooperation, a lot of people who are cheering you on, a lot of people who say, hey, you're welcome to join right in as long as you're willing to work. And you get to some of these other cities and it's not the same. I experienced it when I went and ran some stations down in Montgomery. I know Tom Cupo experienced it when he left to uh, run the conference centers in Virginia. And Rich experienced it when he went to run the baseball club. I don't know if I felt when I went to Montgomery it was going to be just like Chattanooga. I knew it wouldn't, but you know, there's a hope that there would be. And it's not that the people are bad or the, the situation's bad. 
they're just in a different place and, and, and different things of importance. And what you find or what I found in Chattanooga is, is a very, um, the water's warm. Come on in. You know, as long as you're willing to work, you know, we want you to be part of it. If you're willing to get out there, this town's willing to accept yeah. you. I've felt that. I moved to Knoxville for a few years mm-hmm. and that first year I was like, I've got to get back. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't really have, I like I couldn't put my finger on what that was, but now after being here for a little bit, um, seven years, I don't know the exact timeline, but um, I realize it is such a vibrant city in every ecosystem. Like I'm in the business ecosystem every day and truly everyone that you meet wants to help your business grow. Yeah. And I think if you go back to when we had Jim Kennedy on, Jim's kind of the unofficial historian of Chattanooga and and he literally was in most of the rooms over the last couple of decades when so much progress was being made. And it really goes back to what's called the Chattanooga way that they, they, you know, dating back to the eighties uh, when they started to look and go, you know, what, jobs are fleeing. Our young talent is leaving. Our kids are moving away. What are we going to do about this brain drain? And they started to do the visioning and it it's Chattanooga has become known for the private public partnerships. And you bring a lot of different organizations together. I've said this before and, and I've compared it to Memphis because I grew up in Memphis, um, but it, it could be really be any city. Chattanooga doesn't have better ideas than other cities. Every city's got good ideas. What Chattanooga's got different, in my opinion, is that things get done. You don't spend a lot of time with people fighting over who gets this portion or who gets mm-hmm. that portion. If it's recognized as a good idea, everyone kind of leaves their priorities at the door and says, okay, this is what we're going to do, and it gets done. And I think the aquarium was a linchpin, but also a big impetus of Mr. Lupton mm-hmm. and, and his support. But things like the 21st Century Riverfront. I was listening to um, Tom Griscom's, but we're, he was talking about Enterprise South before we had Volkswagen. And it was the, um, the year prior to the Volkswagen announcement, Toyota was – the main suitor they were after. And the announcement came that Toyota was going to Mississippi. Everyone could have said, you know what? We're never going to get a car. Mm-hmm. We're never going to get a car manufacturer. And just throwing their hands up and parcel it out. And the vision of Claude Ramsey was, no, we're going we're gonna to hold firm. We're going to get this. And I think that's kind of the difference is that that was an unpopular decision, I'm sure, in those circles. Yeah. But he held strong, and everyone supported him. No one came out and said, "You know, Claude's wrong. We got to cut this up. Let's let's get a bunch of things." It's the way teams work. When we're behind closed doors and, and arguing these things, we're going to hear everyone's opinion. But once we make a decision, we're a team, and I think we do a pretty good job of that here. There's plenty of room for improvement, but I think that's what sets mm-hmm. us apart. Do you want to move on to some funny stuff? <laughs> sure. That was a little serious. Huh? <laughs> yeah, got a little serious. Um, so I noticed that a lot of people either drink coffee or they are anti-coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the true. first one that comes to mind for me is Roy Vaughn, who has a Diet Coke obsession. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've known Roy a while now and he's Diet Coke's addicting. I used to drink, I bet you five or six a day. A day? Yeah. Oh, easy. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I, I got off of it. But the thing I like about that question, I think it relaxes people. Mm-hmm. But it also, it, you know, everyone's unique. It's something as ubiquitous as coffee. Everyone's got a different way of taking it. Yeah, I, I, I drink mine black, but you know what? I drink decaf. Or I put 10 scoops of this in a tea bag and this and that. Everyone's got a different formula. There's a comfort that everyone has in their coffee. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something about I can face the day if I have my coffee with my two scoops of hot cocoa and my stevia and my Tabasco sauce. That's the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's being exposed to different things. And, and you know, you're talking about being exposed to new coffee, but if you look at the overall podcast, 
we're all being exposed to new mm-hmm. people and new ideas and new stories and, and things like that. And, and frankly, that's, that's what I've enjoyed. Yeah, about I, it. Well, I think Candy Johnson said it best at the end of her episode. She mentioned that you usually have heard of someone, maybe you haven't met them or maybe you have met them and you just have these preconceived notions about who they are, how they got where they are. And this podcast is really about breaking that down. Yeah. That's why I enjoy it. And the other thing, and it kind of goes back when we started and what I wanted to do it. One of the things I really missed about running a television station was the people it put me with and the conversations I was able to have. This is a good filler for this, but it also opens it up for others to hear the same thing. Okay, I want to mention a couple of funny things. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the funny things. Please okay. do. I, I will never forget Scott Martin, and you <laughs> asked him about, I, I guess the conversation was about converting the tennis courts to pickleball yeah. courts. Yeah, yeah. And you asked him if uh, pickleball will be around for a while, and he goes, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care about pickleball. <laughs> it's more about the city being able to quickly adapt to things, but just the way that he said it. <laughs> oh, it was immediate. Yeah, I don't care. About yeah, but that, that's and, his and, personality. And it's the hottest thing going right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it may be the biggest sport in 10 years, and it may be a, we need to convert these pickleball courts back to right, tennis courts. Right. You never yeah. know. And Scott Martin yeah. doesn't care. You know, similar to that, and it wasn't necessarily a humorous moment, but I really enjoyed the passion with, in Rich Mazinga when I asked him if if Pete Rose should be in the oh, Hall yeah. of Fame. Absolutely, Absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love just the moments when guests got passionate. Yeah, and and I got to go back to Kenyatta on that one. When I asked the, what would you tell your 25-year-old self? I, I love what Kenyatta had to say. Um, be who you are. There's only one you. And everything's going to be okay. I've gone back to listen to kind of those closing, what would you tell yourself? And there's a couple themes running through there. That's one of them. Be who you are. Don't look over your shoulder and compare yourself. That's, that's, that's fool's gold. You're wasting your time. The others relate to that, you know, have confidence in yourself. But I, I felt a big one. A lot of people talked about relationships. Yeah, and their family yeah. and their family and relationships, you're going through life. You never know who you're going to meet and build relationships with folks. Take time to talk to them. Take time to listen to them because they come back to you in spades. You get so much more out of it if you take the time to build it. And the thing I, the one I, I stick with because I've, I've always been guilty of it is no amount of worrying about the future is going to change the future. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. It's so much easier said than done. Though. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, it, it's, it's hell. I mean, we can't change what happened yesterday. We can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. We might as well just face what's here. But it's easier said than done. But the number of people who have said something to that variation on there, I I think should show everyone that we're going to be a lot better or you'll be happier. Your mental health will be better if you'd focus on what's in front of you instead of what's behind you or what's in front Mm -hmm. of you. As you were talking, the only person that I could think of is Dr. Rebecca Ashford. Oh, wow. <laughs> because I say, wow, because she is one disciplined yeah, person. Yeah, and you say easier said than done, and she's like, nope, just do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, her, her podcast was a, a great eye-opener for me. I had met her a few times, but we had never really spoken. I did not realize how disciplined mm-hmm. she was. Yeah, she gets up at 3 a.m. and works out for a couple hours. Yeah. And then goes in and runs a, a univer or a college and then does all the requisite social stuff you have to do when you're the president of Chattanooga State Community College. And always has a smile on her face. And is always. the kindest person. Yeah. And the other thing I found really interesting about her was she's a first generation college graduate in her family. And she's established a scholarship at Chattanooga State in honor of her dad. You don't hear that a lot. It's amazing. Yeah, and a lot of it, a lot of these are. And, and what I'm fond of telling people is, we're going to talk to a lot of people whose names you know, and we're going to talk to some you don't know yet. But once we talk to them, you're going to remember yeah. them because, again, the premise is everyone's got an interesting story. Mm-hmm. I mean, this has been great for me. I'm learning something new from every person. 
So you're here recording the podcast and editing them. You're hearing these conversations. What are you pulling out that you go, oh, that really helped me? Or, oh, wow, now that makes sense. It, I mean, being exposed to that, how does that benefit you? Yeah, well, generally, I would say, you know, it is easier whenever someone is telling you what has happened to them as opposed to what you should be doing. Yeah, examples much better. Yeah, yeah. And as I said at the beginning, the ones that stick out to me the most are the women business owners and the ups and the downs that they're facing, because I'm facing that every day now. (laughs) So to see someone on the other side of that, who is older than me and saying like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing it every day. Like you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. I will say like a specific example was Felicia Jackson and she was presented this huge check Yeah, and (laughs) her family is on the verge of losing their home. Like she has to provide for her family. It's at that point. And she realizes like she can't say yes to that money or like she can see the ripple effect of that happening Mm -hmm. in the future, even though it means she could put dinner on the table. For a while. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but it was pretty big. 1.2 million. Yeah. I, I remember. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Many dinners on the table. Yeah. Yeah. And still she was like, no, I, I believe in myself. I believe in my business. I'm going to do it on my own. Yeah. And that's got to have an effect to hear other stories like that. Cause I spent my career in the corporate world and kind of, you go on assignment and you're taking risks, but you're not taking your own personal risk. But for someone who gets out there on their own, it's one thing you know, for someone to do it who has the financial wherewithal, the money and the understanding, but a lot of people are tackling this with just an idea and a belief in themselves. And someone like Felicia who says, you know what, I've got this idea for CPR rap, and it was almost divine intervention mm-hmm. the way it came to her. But that belief to go and have these investors come and say, look, we want to invest in your company. Here's the money. Here's what we want out of it. And for her to say, no, I believe more in myself. This money's great. Thank you very much. Don't get me wrong. I'll, I, I'm, I'm honored by this, yeah. but I got to do this my way. And I can't imagine from your perspective what that sounds like. It's made me reevaluate things, that opportunities that I've been presented. And I'm making a decision that affects 30 more decisions. Mm-hmm. And there are correct yeses there are correct no's and there are also wrong yeses and wrong no's and it's really tough to figure those things out but you really just have to believe in yourself and your gut yeah and and, and frankly i think that's where we make things more difficult than they need to be in terms of the people we spoke to most have not had a direct idea of what they wanted to do most have not stumbled into it but took a job did the best they could and then something else opened up. And that's what I'm finding more about careers, career paths at this point, that with the exception of some of the guests that we have wanted to do what they were doing when they were kids. Vance Travis is, yeah. an, is an exception. He was an architect. Yeah, He's always yeah. wanted to be an architect. And, you know, I was pleasantly surprised with Vance because I did not know how in-depth his involvement was over Chattanooga, in Chattanooga's growth over the last 20 years and how connected he was. And shame on me for not learning more about that uh, prior through our friendship. Yeah. Callie Starnes, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whenever yeah, Cal- she was, um, she had to report in high school on yeah. 9-11. 9-11, yeah. And that just triggered that flame in her. Yeah. That reporting made her want to be a reporter anchor. And now she's running Local 3 News, you know, as, as the general manager. Hearing how everyone got to where they are, it's all a different path. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested to know how having a podcast has impacted you either personally or professionally over the past year. It's really been both. Personally, I spoke earlier about how it uh, helped my ego. And it does. I get such a kick out of seeing people socially who go, oh, I listen to your podcast. I saw someone last night. I was at a Christmas party. And I said, oh, yeah, I listen to your podcast. And I I talked to a guy who I know you don't know, and he brought it up. Hearing things like that is extremely heartening, and it does build the ego. 
but it also tells me that we're doing a good job and we're having an impact and we're helping tell people stories that people want to hear. You know, so that's, that's from a personal standpoint. From a professional standpoint, it's opened some doors for me. I've had people reach out to me from a business perspective about my company, and we've been able to do some work together. I've had people reach out and request to be on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And I always find that extremely flattering, that someone would reach out and say, you know what, I'm willing to open up and would like to do it with mm-hmm. you. So I could not have imagined it going better than it has this first year. I'm not trying to establish something that is any bigger than it is. Right now, we're telling Chattanooga stories, but there's a lot of uh, connections and and stories that I have in Memphis. There's there's a lot of connections and stories across the state that I hope we can get to in the next year. Expand our, our pool of subjects. Yeah. I think everyone that you interviewed this year was in Chattanooga other than Stephanie Stuckey, right? Right. Yeah. Stephanie was the only one we did not do in person. Uh, Just to kind of remind people who Stephanie is, she's uh, third generation of the Stuckey's stores that used to dot the interstates. She bought the company uh, from uh, the investment group that owned it and is resurrecting the brand. Everyone uh, who's somewhere around my age remembers riding in the back of a station wagon and stopping at a Stucky stores and getting a pecan log roll. Uh, she's working on on, uh, on revitalizing the brand, but she was a great mm-hmm. conversation too. And what really stuck out to me, stuck, <laughs> stuck out to me <laughs> about her story was she got a phone call asking if she was interested in buying this back. And she was like, well... No, but let me talk to the rest of the family. Apparently they had called everyone else before her <laughs> and everyone said no. And she was like, you know what? Just for that, <laughs> I'll, I'll do, do it. it. And I'll prove you wrong that you should have called me first. And you know what? She has proved yeah. wrong. She's, the approach she's taken is interesting. And it's a difficult approach in that you buy the Stuckey's brand and name. And, and the thing that immediately goes into everyone's minds are the old Stuckey stores. Mm-hmm. She didn't focus on reopening those. Those are very uh, high costs in operating a store. She's building the brand back, as she likes to say, one pecan log roll at a time. And she's getting those things distributed in other stores and, and really establishing that brand. It's a smart way to go. Yeah. So would you mind sharing if you faced any challenges with podcasting over the past year? Or what was the toughest part of having a podcast? Consistency. Um, consistency is tough. You got to commit to it. And a lot of people have an idea to do a podcast. A lot of people start a podcast. Again, Clint Powell, uh, tremendous help to me. And I think Sean told me too, if you're going to do this, you got to be consistent. And so I thought, you know what, to be consistent, I could probably only do this once a week and that'll be consistent enough. Well, I didn't realize once a week's a hell of a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah, and if you start to look at some podcasts, they're every other week or once mm-hmm. a month. Or, so the commitment to do once a week at first was a bit daunting, you know, because you got to line up someone who's willing to do it. And fortunately, we've had a lot of people just say yes. And then you, you've got to do a little research, and then you got to get them in and get it recorded. But that consistency of being able to do it, and I'm sure I've got people on my mail distribution list and people on social media, because I do post this on uh, on the different social media platforms that look at it each week and go, oh my God, can he just shut up about <laughs> my morning cup? Yeah, But that tells me it's doing the right thing. We used to have a saying in the television station, if we produced a promo, if we were tired of seeing it, like, oh God, I can't, I can't watch that damn promo one more time. That means the audience is just now getting used to it. Yeah, that is true. But going back to all of the work that you're putting into it, I mean, I try to make it as easy as possible for you, like with the editing and managing the recording process and the show notes and all of that. But you put in a lot of work. Hold on. No, no, no. Let me keep going. Let me interrupt something. Try to help. Try. Working with you is turnkey. Well, thank you for that. And I want people to understand this. My challenge is I got to get someone to talk to. (laughs) That's it. I got to get someone to talk to. We come in here. 
we have a conversation. You record it. It may go 50 minutes. It may go an hour. But you work your magic with editing, get it into a listenable 35 to 45 minutes, because that's really our sweet spot, where not only is it edited well and has a good flow, but the sound is good. And, and I tell you, that's one of the compliments I always get on this podcast is the quality of the sound. And if anyone's thinking about doing a podcast, I would say make sure you emphasize the quality of the recording, because... If you're just going to do it in your office without the right baffling, without the right microphones, on your computer, it's going to sound like that. And you really want it to sound more professional. And you've been able to offer that. And anyone who wants to do a podcast needs to get in touch with (laughs) Madison at Speakeasy Productions. Uh, you would not go wrong. <laughs> well, thank you for that. But I view and, that... And don't cut that uh, Okay. <laughs> I view that as my job. That's what you're paying me for. And I don't want you to discredit the work that you're putting into this too, because you prep for all of these guests. You do your background research on them and you have the skills to interview, which not everyone can do. My prep is not as extensive as you would think. Whenever we have someone on, I ask them to give me some life career bullet points where you grew up, what you wanted to be, where you went to school, first jobs. And I just use that to guide the conversation. Sometimes they put in some interesting facts that we need to address, but it really is just being able to take the conversation from, well, after you did this, what did you do? And and one of those examples I, I like to give in that one, when we talked to Todd Womack, and Todd was at Erlanger after Bob Corker was elected mayor, and someone approached him about being communications director. And he took the job. And we were talking about what it was like to work for Bob Corker as mayor. And we we had the former senator on, uh, and his episode will be released in January. But he he is a very focused man, a very determined man who gets a lot done. And Todd told a great story that he never told before of, I almost got fired by Bob Corker. (laughs) (laughs) And, and it, it, was, it, was a very, um, it was a very revealing moment, I think, for him and his career to say that I've got this job. I haven't really learned how to work with my boss yet. And that's really probably what it was more than anything else, that he needed to realize that he had to build that relationship a little bit more in terms of the expectations and delivering those. So I like being able to kind of take those germs of guidance and try and get something out of and him. And thankfully, his coworker gave him a heads up on that. Yeah, <laughs> he at least yeah. had a relationship with his coworker where someone told him, like, hey, um, you're kind of on the chopping block here. Right. He relied on a, a confidant who said, I think you need to look at this and figure out what you need to do to improve it. Didn't tell him how to improve right. it. Yeah, that's the key. Which I think is important, too. Yeah. So... Looking ahead yes. at the podcast, yes, uh-huh, uh-huh. what's in store for 2024? Uh, what's in store for 2024? Well, the big news is, is we have yeah, a sponsor. Yay! yay. <laughs> <laughs> My banker says, yay. <laughs> no, I'm thrilled to tell you that starting in January, the Tennessee Valley Authority will be sponsoring. So it'll be My Morning Cup powered by TVA or the Tennessee Valley Authority. And um, that gives us the opportunity. We'll have once a quarter a a guest from TVA. But beyond that, you've got the same podcast, My Morning Cup. We'll be talking to interesting people in our community. And I I think the important tie with TVA is is that talk about ubiquitous. TVA is ubiquitous, not just in Chattanooga, but throughout Tennessee. Their local relationships and how they serve local people is very important to them. So I, I think the match there is very good with My Morning Cup and TVA. Yeah, I think it's so important to emphasize the content is not changing. Of course, we'll mention them in the intro, yeah. but they don't really want us to change anything about the podcast. No they, said, no, they said, we like what you're doing. Just keep what you're doing. And that was important to me. I wasn't going to give up editorial control. Yeah. They like the fact that not only are we talking to different people in the community, but the community is listening right? Yeah, and they help make these conversations yeah. possible. So thank you, TVA. 
Yes, yes, and absolutely. we will also. I'm going to be using more electricity this year. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> and we will also be launching a weekly newsletter for the podcast. What? <laughs> <laughs> I know you're looking at me like we talked you about know, this. We talked about this, Mike. <laughs> Um, but if you want that directly in your inbox, then you can check the link in the show notes of this episode to sign up. Oh, cool. Yeah, so sign up for the newsletter. And uh, for those of you who have been getting those weekly emails from me, guess what? You're getting the newsletter, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, anything else that you want to say before we close out this year? You know, year? I, I, I really want to express my gratitude. I, and one of the things I've learned in this podcast is that being able to express gratitude is very important for a happy life. Because I asked the question, you know, what would you tell your 25-year-old self is important for a happy life? People talk about relationships. People talk about believing in themselves. People talk about just do it. There's a lot of things that are important for a happy life. I think the thing people talk the most about is, and I found this from the people who drive themselves the most, I should have taken more time for my family. I should have taken some time for some other things. There's not a regret looking back, but it's, I, I think, a very real and fresh perspective that says, I probably could have done better. I mean, I, I look at where I am now in my career and some of the, the ways I was when my kids were small and work was a pain in the butt and, and some of the things you say out of just stress and frustration that you go, yeah, that was really stupid. Mm -hmm. But you learn those things. So when I talk about gratitude, I think it's important to say to you, I really appreciate everything you've done for me. You've, you've made this successful, so thank you. Uh, to the people who, are, who have been listening, I could have more gratitude towards you downloading it every week and listening every week and let me know what you think. And that's been just absolutely tremendous. And this podcast wouldn't be what it is or where it is without the people that we've had on. I've had relationships with a lot of them. I haven't had relationships with some of them too, but every one of them have taken time out of their day to sit through this for an hour, have a conversation. They didn't have to do it. No one got and paid to do it. No, well, no, they didn't get paid to do it. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> and even with TVA, they ain't going to get paid to do it. <laughs> well, they get a, they get a coffee mug. They do get a mug. They get a my morning cup mug. And uh, you know what? If you want a my morning cup mug, it's in 1995. <laughs> But just this has been um, very good for my mental health. It sounds the way it sounds, but it's, it's just good to, to have those conversations going, to be part of the community, to know that we're putting something positive out there. I believe these episodes are positive from a lot of different factors. Um, one thing I think that we've been able to do is do a bit of an oral history for Chattanooga. Yeah, yeah. You know, talking to folks who were in the rooms when those decisions were being made about the 21st century waterfront plan, uh, the pursuit of Volkswagen, uh, how the the aquarium was launched. and and But we've also been able to talk to the folks who've been able to say, you know what, we can do better. We can do better. And I, that's a message that I've really wanted to focus on, that Chattanooga's had tremendous success. But it hasn't been equally distributed. And we've got to be able to open up those rooms to everyone. It shouldn't just be the same people in those right. rooms. And these episodes are out there forever. They are. That's the cool yeah. thing. I've really enjoyed this. Yeah, I've enjoyed too. working with you. Um, I look forward to next year. And who knows, maybe uh, in a year or two, we'll be getting the audio Emmy for podcasting. <laughs> yeah, you never know where this is going to go. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to see where we are at the end of 2024. Thanks for listening to My Morning Cup, a podcast by Costa Media Advisors. If you liked this episode, please share it with a friend. I release a new episode each week, so be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts.